So, ladies and gentlemen, great pleasure for me to welcome you to uh, today's conference on the issue of rising power, India. It's a great pleasure that uh, you took time in order to be present and to listen uh, to two speakers, prominent speakers, on the one hand, the Indian ambassador, and on the other hand, uh, Professor Nissel, who uh, was teaching at the University of Vienna for more than 20 years uh, on India, about India. Uh, and insofar, I'm sure that it will be an interesting evening. Of course, it's a great pleasure for me also to welcome a few guests uh, from the auditory. First of all, my vice president from AIES, Christine Mutonen, a long time parliamentarian and also former, <laughs> former president of the OSCE Parliamentary Assembly. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome Peter Haider, to welcome especially, of course, the president of the Austria Indian Association, Radha Anjali, Mrs. President. Hearty welcome to you. <laughs> and I also have on my list uh, the professors, Johannes Merck, Alfred Gerstel, uh, Paul Louis, I have not seen yet, and uh, Paul Michalievich, but I guess maybe they will come a little bit later. Uh, yeah, great pleasure to have you here. And uh, if you allow, I will try to introduce also our today's speakers. The first will be Ambassador Jaideep Masunta. Uh, he studied economy, uh, made his master degree, not only in economy, but also in management. Uh, he is speaking a variety of languages. English, you will, uh, <laughs> of course, experience pretty soon but also some Indian languages like Assamese, Bengali, and Hindi, of course. And he is also speaking Chinese because he had a very interesting and a very, uh, well, uh, uh, quite some career uh, <coughs> at the diplomatic sector uh, that led him to Hong Kong, to Beijing, to Chittagong, to New York, uh, he became deputy chief of mission in Beijing and in Kathmandu. So you can imagine uh, this certainly is quite some post. He served in the prime minister's office uh, also for foreign affairs and uh, security. And he also was chief of protocol. And therefore, we really are happy that after having been uh, the ambassador to the Philippines, he has come to Austria. Hearty welcome to you, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ambassador. Yeah, and the stage is free for you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fasteban, for that very warm uh, introduction and welcome. Um, Dr. Nissel, uh, excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you all for being here. I hear that uh, Dr. Fasleband is a hard taskmaster, so I will uh, try and restrict myself uh, within the 20 minutes that I've been allotted. And please feel free to stop me if I do exceed my time. Uh, my wife uh, tells me that I have a tendency to speak too much in public. <laughs> and uh, she says I don't speak enough uh, with her. Uh, so <laughs> I will try to be as succinct as possible today. Uh, I have been asked to speak on the subject Rising Power India. And one of my colleagues in the embassy said that that sounds very nice, I'm going to be present. So she is uh, present. But uh, at the outset, I want to tell you that uh, I had no hand in the choice of the subject. I was merely asked to speak today. And so I will uh, say some words, and it is for you to judge whether India is rising or not. I will just lay out to you what are India's strengths, what are India's challenges as we go forward. Firstly, the objective reality is that 
one out of every five persons in the world is an Indian. Now, it's not easy to wrap one's head around that concept. Um, for example, if uh, you were to take Austria and uh, uh, assume that the Austrian population represents the world's population, then the combined populations of Vienna, Salzburg, Innsbruck, Linz, and Graz would be India's population. So that gives you an idea of that <laughs> scale. Therefore, uh, I would posit that what India does and how Indians do will be of profound importance for the rest of the world, at least for the rest of the century. The present international situation, of course, is a challenging one for most countries and also for India. The challenges we face are our energy dependence. India imports over 80% of our oil and gas. The soaring cost of energy makes the economy vulnerable to the global energy price trends. Dependence on imports of defense products is also very high, despite the fact that over the years we have developed our indigenous light combat aircraft, our light attack helicopters, we manufacture our own destroyers and frigates, we have just launched our own indigenous aircraft carrier, but the fact is that even today, 60% of our defense uh, products, our defense armaments, uh, originate from Russia, although we have diversified our defense uh, imports uh, quite considerably over the years. Thirdly, the population below the poverty line in India is still unacceptably high. According to the World Bank estimates, between 7 and 10 percent of Indians live below the poverty line. And this is still over 100 million people. And to lift the size of population of that size out of poverty is a mammoth task for any government. And fourthly, India is situated in an unstable neighborhood. From terrorism and religious fundamentalism to countries facing financial default and political instability, we also face significant threats to the country's territorial integrity across our 3,500 long, kilometer long border with China. All this requires India to devote considerable resources to the attention of her periphery. On the positive side, Despite these challenges, India's economy has been growing rapidly. India has overtaken the United Kingdom this year to emerge as the fifth largest economy in the world. The growth rate of uh, GDP in the quarter April to June was an astonishing 13.5%. We expect to grow at more than 7% next year. And at this rate, we will overtake Germany in 2027 and Japan in 2029 to become the third largest economy in the world after the United States and China. Our foreign exchange reserves are half a trillion, which is a comfortable figure and one of the largest in the world. Our inflation rate is manageable, even today at between six and seven percent. Incredible as it may sound, for nearly 25 years, we have had political stability with governments that have each completed five full year terms. And that is very important. We expect to reap the demograph demographic dividend from a large young population that is increasingly well educated and is embracing technology and the digital world at an unprecedented pace. This has opened up vast opportunities for innovation, growth, development and prosperity. If you take industry, as the COVID pandemic showed, supply chain issues can be highly disruptive for any economy. And India has an extensive and very diverse industrial base. Agriculture, food security is very important for a country with India's size, as recent developments have shown. From a chronically food deficit country in the 50s and 60s and 70s, India today is a large net exporter of food grains and other food products. India is really the largest or the second largest producer of rice, wheat, sugar, lentils, 
vegetables, fruits, milk, and a number of other products. Science and technology. Last year, India produced 1.5 million engineers. Now, this is a figure which is even more than what China produces. And that is uh, really incredible. So this has gone into our development as a space power, which is another key ingredient of uh, the world of the future. We, we produce our own satellite launch vehicles. We have sent a probe to Mars at a cost which is less than what it took to produce the movie Gravity. <laughs> we have a manned space program. As a digital power, India is growing as a digital economy with digital yeah. governance, with the average citizen being able to access services and benefits from the government directly through a digital medium, whether it's a cell phone or a computer. The spread of cell phones in India has been a game changer with apps which are people friendly. Today, a lot of interface between government and the citizen has been reduced to direct interface. That has reduced uh, corruption in government. Uh, so you do not need to access government uh, facilities and government services through medium of a person. You can do it directly through your digital medium. Semiconductors and chip making is, of course, the area where, uh, which is of great importance for the economies of the future. And we now have a national program for chip making. Uh, some of the biggest semiconductor companies are coming up in India. Foxcom and Vedanta have a, alone they have a $19 billion factory coming up in India. Entrepreneurship and in innovation. This is going to be the economy of the future, innovation and entrepreneurship. One, uh, we are one of the top three countries in the world in terms of startups after the United States and China. Till the beginning of last month, India was home to 107 unicorns valued at 340 billion US dollars. Out of them, 65 unicorns had, with a combined valuation of $120 billion, were born only in the last year. And this year, we have overtaken China with the largest number of unicorns this, in the first half of this year, and that puts India just behind the United States. This, uh, the, all this is important, but I think for a country to have influence in the world, Soft power is also very important. And democracy, human rights, belief in fundamental freedoms, a free press, an independent judiciary, rule of law, these are all conditions that we set great store by. And India is a powerful example of a democracy that can work in a vast, mega diverse developing country in the world. Mahatma Gandhi, non-violence, sustainable living, these are all also examples of the soft power. India's color, festivals, food, who doesn't like Indian food? Mm -hmm. Indian cinema, which has a breadth of influence through all of North Africa, Eastern Africa, throughout Southeast Asia, right up to Japan, where some Indian actors are actually iconic uh, uh, actors in Japan. So this gives you an example of the uh, influence of not just Bollywood, but Indian cinema as a whole. It could be Tamil cinema, it could be Bengali cinema, it can be so many other regional uh, cinema as well, all over Central Asia. Uh, I always uh, like to tell you the story of uh, uh, how in China there was a particular television series which was so powerful that one, when I used to go to meet uh, governors and mayors in provinces uh, throughout China, they would tell me that uh, their wives were so keen on watching this that they would tell them, don't come home until this is over, because it was shown on CCTV throughout the country. <laughs> and this is I'm, this I'm talking about uh, in the early 2000s, and then the, one of the stars of that show went on, is now one of our ministers in our cabinet. Uh, another soft power I think that we have is uh, our entire medical and pharmaceutical industry. 
from the smallest islands of the Pacific, where I, I was amb as ambassador to Philippines, as Dr. Fastaban said, I was also ambassador to two other small island states in the Pacific. And people would come from as far away from there to India for medical treatment. And from the Philippines, we used to have hundreds and thousands of people who would come to India. And this extends all the way through West Asia, through Africa, and at, of course, in our own periphery. So medical facilities, which are world class and yet inexpensive, is, I think, a great soft power that we have. Uh, much of Africa dependent on, was, was dependent on antiretrovirals during the HIV pandemic. And many millions would have died if they, could not, if they were not able to access the very uh, inexpensive Indian retrovirals at that time. And many countries in Africa uh, recount this with great gratitude. I, and I haven't even mentioned yoga and Ayurveda, which is uh, taking the world by storm. Now, these are the uh, conditions under which uh, we are. Uh, but also, it's, uh, I think, a mindset. Uh, there is a newfound confidence in India. Uh, this is seen, uh, we are seen today as embracing a global agenda. We are no longer defensive about things like climate change, for example. We are right out there in the forefront. We are the only G20 country which has already met our Paris commitments. We have extremely ambitious agenda for uh, green energy, for reducing the carbon footprint, um, uh, reducing the intensity of carbon in our GDP. Um, and uh, we have uh, set up world institutions like the International Solar Alliance, along with France, of which uh, hundred, more than 100 countries have already joined it. We have uh, the Prime Minister announced in 2019 a coalition for disaster resilient infrastructure in which presently 31 countries and six international organizations have joined. We are launching a very ambitious green hydrogen program. So this confidence is also apparent uh, during the COVID pandemic where we, um, we uh, took the leadership role in supplying medicines and vaccines to over 76 countries all over the world and also developed our own indigenous COVID vaccines. On the multilateral stage, um, we were president of the Security Council when, um, when the Taliban took over in Afghanistan again. And we were successful in piloting the resolution 2593, which is a path-breaking resolution which brought everybody together, even though this could have been a very divisive issue. And that is really the benchmark uh, of uh, how the world is dealing with the situation in Afghanistan. And next year, we will be assuming the chair of the G20 with a very ambitious agenda. Um, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Uh, I have about five minutes. <laughs> um, now, uh, the pursuit of uh, strategic autonomy has been a guiding force of our national effort. And our global diplomacy has been guided by this principle. These principles of Indian diplomacy are, firstly, diplomacy to serve the national interest, which is, of course, self-evident. Every country does that. And in our case, this means to create and maintain conditions that enable economic development with peace and security. We have moved from non-alignment to multi-alignment. Faith in multilateralism, but a reformed multilateralism. We wish to have reforms in the UN Security Council, in organizations like the WTO, like the WHO, and so many others. Globalization that benefits all, and not only multinationals, or a few multinationals. Support for a rules-based international order. So these are the principles on which our diplomacy is based. And to support these objectives over the years, India has built a web of relationships throughout Asia and, in fact, throughout the world. In terms of our region, we have a very strong neighborhood-first policy that talks about integration of our neighborhood with our economies to bring about interdependence. We have extended grants and lines of credit 
to all our neighbors, but these have never been at the cost of their financial sustainability. It has always been environmentally sustainable. For example, in Afghanistan, um, even today, uh, although officially we do not recognize the Taliban regime, we, are, uh, we have sent them the, recently the seven consignment of food grains because hunger is a major issue there. We have uh, supplied a million doses of COVID vaccines and uh, tons of uh, uh, pharmaceuticals to the hospitals there. And during uh, the previous regime, of course, we um, built everything from roads to hydroelectric dams to their parliament building. So we believe very strongly that India cannot be strong and secure unless our neighborhood is strong and secure. India has been a net security provider and a first responder as from as early as the Indian Ocean tsunami of 2004 and until recently the Nepal earthquake where we were again the first responders. In the larger region of Asia, uh, one of our foremost partnerships is with ASEAN, with which we have a strategic partnership. We have civilizational links with the whole of Southeast Asia, and we have a robust individual relationship with countries like Singapore and Vietnam. West Asia, we are seeing, we have already a diaspora of more than three and a half million people in West Asia, and Indians constitute the largest expatriate population in these countries, a great source of energy, and now of investment. Our relationships with countries like the UAE and Saudi Arabia have undergone a, a tremendous uh, development over the last few years. We have good relations with Iran as well. In Central Asia, the SCO brings us together with countries like, uh, with the Central Asian countries, as well as with China and Russia. With Africa, we have a summit relationship where we have had three summits so far. We have large diaspora in Africa. We have capacity building. We have extended about 20,000 scholarships to African students to come and study in India. We have infrastructure pod projects. We have set up the Pan-African IT network, the Pan-African telemedicine network. The Forum of India and Pacific Island Countries, which is in the far east of uh, India, in the Western Pacific, we have a, a summit relationship with those countries as well, where we do a lot of capacity building. I myself have organized a sustainable development summit there with the 10 countries uh, of the Western Pacific. And that is the third summit that we had. We have... Uh, very robust relationships with Australia, with Japan, and the Republic of Korea. We have annual summits with Japan and Russia and for many years. And this year, we are starting our annual summits with Australia at the prime minister level. In the larger world, of course, India's relations with the United States are today closer and more multidimensional than at any time in our history. It is also global in terms of our engagement in Quad, the Indo-Pacific, pandemic mitigation, climate change mitigation, global supply chains, sustainable infrastructure development, and terrorism. The relationship has been transformed in the past 10 years, and today it counts for among our closest and most substantive relationships. In Europe, France, Germany, and UK have traditionally been our major partners. And interestingly enough, much smaller countries have come to the fore. With, for example, with Denmark, we have a green energy partnership. With Germany, we have a very comprehensive biennial intergovernmental consultations at the head of government level. But it brings together the all the ministries of government. And it is a very, very comprehensive uh, engagement. For the first time this year, we had uh, a summit of all 27 EU member states with our Prime Minister. We are uh, negotiating a foreign trade agreement, an FTA, as well as an investment agreement. We share much in common, democracy, human rights, fundamental freedoms. We do see a renewed interest in India for Europe, and we see this reciprocated in Europe. And I will say this, that if... Europe were to place as much uh, emphasis, as much uh, interest, and as much focus on, as it did on China for the last 20 years, it would be well, well worth it. 
Um, even in the case of Austria, for example, our foreign ministers have already met four times this year after Minister Schallenberg visited India in March. So all in all, throughout Europe, we see a great deal of interest in engagement with India, and this is well reciprocated. Our big neighbor, China. Um, we share, of course, a 3,500 kilometer long border, and many parts of it are disputed, contested. We wish to have a relationship of cooperation rather than conflict, and not to let differences become disputes, and the disputes to result in conflict. We need to manage our differences. That, there was a consensus on this between the two countries, starting from the mid early 90s and stretching up to 2017. But that consensus seems to have broken down in the last five years. There, in all this time, our soldiers who would patrol the borders were not permitted to carry any arms, not even a pistol. But today, we have a border in our northwestern front, which is bristling with arms. Uh, we have 50,000 troops on each side, uh, eyeball to eyeball. We have painstakingly long dialogue at the diplomatic as well as military levels. We are making slight progress in that, but uh, we have to remain vigilant. Uh, we have made it clear to China that it cannot be business as usual in the face of unprovoked aggressive behavior. With Russia, we have relations that goes back decades. We have an annual summit between the Russian president and our prime minister. We have extensive cooperation in defense, which I've already talked about. The Russian nuclear power plants uh, that are being constructed are important for decarbonization of our energy mix. Russia has stood by India for many years, even when the West actually chose to support a military dictatorship in our region. In terms of our other relationships, um, we have a whole web of relationships. We have trilateral relationships with India, Japan, and Australia, where we are doing a, a significant number of joint projects in Southeast Asia and Eastern Asia. We have a, a trilateral between India, France, and the UAE, which has just been launched, which has tremendous promise as well. We have a trilateral between India, Australia, and Indonesia. You, of course, know about the Quad between India, Australia, Japan, and the US. And we have just launched another quad, which is called the Western Quad, the I2U2, the India, Israel, UAE, and US Quad, which uh, will focus on joint investments and new initiatives in water, energy, transportation, space, health, and food security. In conclusion, we live in a challenging world environment. Mm -hmm. India has multidimensional relations with a host of global actors that is essential for our primary objective, which is to create and maintain conditions that support peace, security, and development. We believe in the long run that that is a good investment. I thank you for your attention <clears throat> and apologize for exceeding my time by five minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I think after this first presentation, we can already have one very clear conclusion. This was not only highly interesting, it also was presented uh, with a smile and a charming <laughs> voice. So far, we could say India certainly has become a rising, not only a rising, but a strong, soft power. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Ambassador. Uh, yeah, our next speaker will be uh, Professor Hans Niesel. He studied in Vienna, geography, sociology, and uh, philosophy. And he also made postgraduate studies at, at my list, it is still called at Bombay University. So yes, correct. Yes. Mumbai <laughs> University. I don't know. Uh, uh, I guess this will be the actual name. 
After he had finished his doctorate, uh, he held positions at different universities in Germany, uh, like in Cologne, in Berlin, and in uh, Marburg. And in the year 2000, he became professor at the university in Vienna. And he taught here for more than 20 years. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Also, I, I do not uh, talk about all the functions you have. <laughs> he also is a vice president uh, of the Austrian Indian Association. And of course, in many, uh, in many institutions, he's teaching and especially also presenting uh, his view on India, and insofar we are looking forward to your presentation. Thank Please, you, Professor. thank you very much. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I call my lecture Some Facts and Arguments. Of course, Ambassador Masunda took the political dimension already, so I'm happy. I have not to go into that. Uh, what makes a country powerful? Its population, its size, its the political structure and aspirations, a strong economy, military power, brains in all main dimensions. India has it all, democracy, demography, economy and military power. I try to highlight these points, but most important, the biggest trash of India, brains, brains, brains. Democracy was presented already, but I think it is so important that India is proud to be the biggest democracy in the world. I would say surrounded by non-democratic or pseudo-democratic countries. Okay, this is a political action. Uh, it has all the institutions, a critical press, and since a few years, huge social media networks. So there are strict controls in many fields. Uh, for many other countries, India is an example that progress is possible upholding human values within democracy, against autocracy. Yes, you are right, I mean China. The size, three million, and 287,000 square kilometer, world rank seven, 39 times bigger than Austria. Population, more than 1.4 billion people, rank two, 157 times Austria. So we are right to say India is not only a country, it is a subcontinent in so many ways so complicated, but at the same time, as, this, as we still say, diversity in unity, or unity in diversity, it still works. Uh, let me continue with uh, demography. Uh, as we already heard, uh, India accounts for more than 18% of the world population and will overtake China already next year, the year to come. So far the projections were 2025 to 27. It's not true anymore, it's next year. UN World Population Prospects, July 22. Compare with our European Union, 450 million. Add in South Asia, Pakistan, 236 million. Bangladesh, 171, and other neighbors, it sums up to more or less 1.9 billion people, this is a quarter of the world population. And this is one side of the importance of South Asia and India. Most important, India's population is young and will be so till 2050. Compare India to Europe, Russia or Japan. The median age is 28, the life expectancy is already 71. In 1933, it was 29, imagine, imagine this change in two generations. This uh, estimate is a so-called window of opportunity for the working force. India will be young till 2050. That's a big difference to China. But providing jobs is the biggest challenge Indian has to provide 
one million jobs per month to, to its young people. One million jobs per month. The total fertility rate differ is already below a replacement level in most of the Indian states. I think many people don't know that. 2.1 child's children per mother. Uh, not in Bihar, not in UP, but in most other states of India. Of course, there is one big problem is the male-female constellation. The problem of missing girls in India, same as in many other countries in the world, but 45 million missing girls. There are religious, traditional, social and economic reasons for that. It's a, it's a complicated story. But India, considering uh, the Human Development Index, is still lagging behind. Measured are life expectancy, education, and per capita income. At the moment, India is at the position of 132 out of 191. China, 79. Also, there exists an ever-growing north-south disparity concerning birth rates and other democratic indicators. This is, for instance, a huge problem for the elections. Parliament seats are adjusted regionally, not reflecting the population distribution anymore. So in a few years, Bihar will need one, three times more votes, more people for one parliament seat than, for instance, Kerala. So in the long run, it will be a big political problem. Uh, population increase, 2001 to 2011, 108 one million people. This means uh, two times Austria per year, just to give the relation. Uh, but what happened? In the last decade, the census, March 2021, was not done for the first time in 140 years. Due to corona pandemic, not done up today. This poses serious problems for planning in various fields. Ambassador Masumba told us so much already about the economy, so I simply try to add some facts. About 1990, 30 years ago, India's GDP, gross domestic product, held the 12th position in the world ranking. Then it took the country 20 years to reach the ninth position. Up to 2015, Brazil, Italy and Canada were overtaken, while Britain and France were already in close distance. Meanwhile, India climbed to the fifth position, and up to 2030, as Ambassador mentioned already, it will surpass Japan and Germany, that means third position, after then China, number one, and US, second. Uh, some comments, some predictions up to 2050 claim the second place for India in 2050 overruling the US. I'm not sure about that, but, but Bryce Waterhouse Coopers has made this. Uh, in the financial year, April 2021 to March 2022, the economy had an impressive growth of 8.9%. Uh, the year before, of course, due to Corona, it was minus 5.3%. But in the last three months, it was 13.5% from April to June. So in the years to come, the average growth is estimated at 7% annually. This will be much bigger than the estimates for China, of course, from a lower base. That's the second point. Now, GDP stands at more than 3 billion US dollars. Government aims, up, aims at 5 trillion up to 2025. Less impressive is the GDP per capita. It's only 2,185 at the moment. So we have some countries with more than 50,000 in the world. Uh, uh, purchasing power, 7,300, July 22. So the financial and gold reserves are immense, $540 billion. Uh, you have to know that in 1990, the 
Indian economy was really collapsing. There was no money left and no gold reserve, nothing. So it's impressive. Uh, within the G20, the leading industrial countries, India is the fastest growing economy today. India's economic positions, as Ambassador Masumda aptly told you, first in a number of agricultural products. Last year, agricultural exports alone made up $35 billion. I remember as a student in India that India had to import wheat to feed, to feed the people. What a change. Uh, second, crude steel producer, third largest consumer market with emerging new middle classes. Remember this young population for the next decades. Cumulative FDI inflow in 20 years around six, $600 billion. Uh, one new item, 834 million internet subscribers. 834 million internet subscribers. There are huge government programs, Digital India and Make in India, to bring India in the, in the forefront. Uh, I cannot explain it here, it's, it would take too much time, but you see, you see these two uh, signs, Digital India Government In and Make in India Com. These are huge, huge uh, programs. Just uh, the idea is digital empowerment of all citizens and government and services on demand for all citizens. It sounds fantastic. Uh, maybe there is a certain danger of Big Brother watching you. It's, it's just a question. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Make in India program has a five-pillar strategy to drive Indian growth. Infrastructure, manufacturing growth, sustainable energy efficiency, skill development, and improved business environment. These are the five pillars, and you will find in the internet uh, all, all these 25 main fields of making India. It's a long, long story. Uh, finally, military power. Uh, India has a new face in my eyes. It's changed from an idealistic to a realistic worldview. It would take a lot of time to explain. So, uh, without military strengths, one cannot claim to be a big power in multilateral geostrategic politics. Now India holds 1.4 million men under arms, maybe second only to China, but the Chinese figures are not so clear. The Global Firepower Index is consisting of 55 variables it, uh, it for 137 countries, and it places India in the fourth position after USA, Russia, and China. Afterwards, followed by France, Japan, UK, and Germany. Compare Austria's position. We are number 56. Okay, we're a friendly nation. Nice, nice people. Uh, <laughs> highest military spending world was in <laughs> 2021. United States far, far leading, but second position, China. And believe it or not, India's in the third position. Did you know that? $76 billion last year. Before, UK, Russia, France, Germany, and so on, and so on. Uh, Premier Modi inaugurated the first Indian air carrier, homemade air carrier, on the 2nd of September. 43,000 dead weight tons, 320 meters long. It's a tremendous thing. India is a nuclear power since May 1998. Uh, India holds around 150 atomic spearheads and has developed rockets and missiles and to a range of 5,000 kilometers and is a main competitor in space today. Uh, India is one of the few nations that can start nuclear weapons from sea, from land, and from air. There are only four nations in the world doing that. And finally, 
I would like to mention ISRO, Indian Space Research Organization. 20,000 people are work, 20,000 high-ranking scientists, technicians, engineers are working in 12 centers all over India. Hundreds of satellite launches have been done. And most important, to only 20 to 30 percent of the costs of NASA and ESA. This is the reason why hundreds of satellites from more than 40 other countries have been started in India with Indian technology. So they are in the forehead uh, uh, in this field again. Now, when I was assistant at Marburg University, my neighbor was working on physical geography of uh, the darkest area in Earth. It was the Congo Basin. And I said, how can you work in the heart of darkness? He said, no, no. The, the, the worst country in the world is India. I said, why? Why? He said, oh, it is too much of everything. Thank you for your attention. Yeah. Heinz, thank you very much for this lot of information you gave us in this very short time. And I guess uh, we really had the opportunity to learn a lot about uh, the country. Okay, uh, I will try now to make sort of a resume and maybe stress a few points uh, and add a few uh, details if you allow. I prepared a lot of charts, but I will not present everyone. <laughs> so far, you uh, need not to be uh, nervous that it could be too long. Uh, let me try to start. I usually say, okay, uh, when we are talking about the great power, I usually uh, do present this picture that shows five circles or ellipses, uh, three blue ones, this is European Union, this is Russia, and this is India, as powers, second grade, and uh, the red circles is United States and China, first grade uh, global powers. The question is, uh, what are the perspectives for India in the future? And uh, maybe I try, you know, to make immediately uh, a sum up. What are the strongholds mm -hmm. and what are the challenges? Because India certainly is a rising power, but uh, what can it do? The strongholds for me are the human potential due to the demographic development. It is the central geostrategic position. I will talk a little bit about that. It's the question of democracy and also the richness and diversity of the culture and the country which offers links and openness uh, practically to any other culture. And it's, uh, as the fourth point, the cultural closeness to, highly, to the highly developed world due to uh, English language uh, and also, you know, uh, easy access to the best universities of the world, whether this is uh, in Great Britain or in America. Uh, of course, India also does have challenges. And the biggest or the first challenge, as far as I see it, is the starting position compared to the other great powers. If you compare India with uh, China, with America, with Europe, and with Russia, of course, the starting position uh, is not easier, but certainly is harder. It also does have structural deficits, a lack of homogeneity. If you think of China, you know, uh, a nation of 1.3 billion people, uh, Han Chinese people speaking the same language and having more or less the same culture. This is completely different and of course this uh, lack of homogeneity makes it not always easy to find decisions and to find uh, a clear line. There's also a lack of infrastructure, if I compare it with the other great powers, uh, and a lack of instruments for power projection. I just want to name one. The foreign ministry in 
uh, India only has less than 1,000 people as far as I know. Maybe in the meantime it has become more. But 1,000 people in order to make power politics for the whole world, you can imagine, this certainly is not enough as an instrument. And uh, third point, it has a very strong rival in the neighborhood. Everybody knows that I'm talking about uh, China, of course. And the fourth, but I think uh, maybe in the long run, one of the most important points certainly is the question of keeping the right balance between Hindu nationalism, just taking the majority uh, what probably is a need in order to shape uh, one uh, or in one direction oriented uh, poli policy on the one hand and keeping the balance with the big Muslim minority, 14%, 200 million people. And insofar, uh, it will not be so easy all the time to keep this balance. Okay, let me try to go into a few details now. Uh, first of all, I wanted to present you uh, the statistics of the most 25 most populous countries. I do not go into details, just one thing. From now to, at the moment, you know, uh, China still is a little bit bigger from the population uh, than India. Already in two years, probably, they will be surpassed. But already in 2050, mm. India will be China plus Brazil, just from the size mm -hmm. of the population. So far, you can imagine that there is quite uh, an increase that really uh, is, is uh, relevant for the future. You can see this on the, if you compare the population, you know, you can see, you know, China with the one child, pop, uh, child policy, uh, of course, they are uh, losing in the long run uh, quite a bit. On the other hand, you have India, uh, this uh, population pyramid, which is very sound. Yeah, if we look at uh, the situation in the long run, you can see that now, for the first time in history since 1800, will be the situation that India will surpass China by population. And the interesting thing is, as I said already in 2050, India will be China plus Brazil. And the most interesting thing is that at the end of the century, India probably will have doubled the size of China because China is shrinking. And maybe this is the medium range estimate from United Nations mm -hmm. at the end of the century will go down to around about less than 800 million people and India will have double the size. And of course, this will mean a lot because uh, as I presented already last time, you know, demographic development means more labor force, a bigger market size, means of course, due to the labor force and the market, higher technological level, and this is also the basis for military power, cultural power, and political power. On the other hand, of course, it's extremely difficult, you know, when you have a shrinking uh, population to keep up the market size and a market growth, as you, for example, uh, can see very easily with the development of Japan. They can invest what they want. The government can spend as much money uh, as the prime minister uh, is, is ready to do, but they will not be able, you know, to have a growing market due to the shrinking population. Shrinking uh, population means shrinking market, means shrinking investment in the long run, at least. Okay, if we look... Uh, uh -huh. I lost it, yeah. And this is just a comparison of workforce in Asian regions compared on the, on the one hand, this is the blue one, is East Asia. Uh, then the orange one is South Asia, 
not only India, but also Pakistan, Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And the gray one, this is Southeast Asia. And what you can see now that at the moment, you know, in 2020, East Asia has by far the biggest working force. Already in 2050, mm -hmm. India will have a much, much bigger, and South Asia will have a much, much bigger working force than East Asia and South Asia. And if you look, you know, uh, at the end in 2100, you can see no comparison anymore. Of course, it will be far, far beyond. Uh, this also will mean, you know, uh, a decisive factor is uh, the growth of, uh, the glo of the middle class. I do not go into details, but you just can see, I hope I can show it over here. Uh -huh. It does not go that far. Uh, yeah, that the biggest increase, uh, of course, will be in South Asia. Just take it as a picture, and uh, I w it would take too long time uh, to explain it in detail. This is just the growth of uh, the, the big four, you know, you can see, you know, on the one hand, United States will increase. They also will uh, better their relation uh, versus China. China will go down, Russia will go down, India will increase. Of course, these, those are different levels so far. It's only the development for the future uh, that you can see over here. Yeah, second point was geostrategic position. India has certainly an extremely central position in, within the Indian Ocean. I mean, if you compare it, you know, you can see India is situated next to the Strait of Hormuz, uh, uh, to the Red Sea entrance, on the other hand, also to the Strait of Malacca, uh, towards Eastern Asia, towards uh, Africa, towards Australia. Let me look at uh, the next map. The yellow region that you can see here, this is the region with the highest population growth uh, in the next decades. So far, uh, world growth, not only from the population, but also uh, in the economy, will happen over here. And also in this context, India will have a very central position in the middle between Africa, Western Asia, uh, and Southeastern Asia is India or uh, uh, South Asia as a whole. India also is in the middle of the two geostrategic key areas. On the one hand, between the Middle East area, and on the other hand, also uh, due to Southeast Asia with uh, the question of uh, South China Sea and uh, also this central position between Eastern Asia, Southern Asia, uh, the central position in the Indo-Pacific area. And this certainly will be of utmost importance. Uh, yeah, what many people are forgetting that India does not only <coughs> consist out of the continent, but also of the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Uh, and those islands are situated very closely to Southeast Asia. Most people don't know that India only has a distance of 100 miles away from Indonesia. It's neighboring uh, Thailand and it's neighboring uh, Myanmar in a specific way. And insofar, because this is not so, uh, people are not so much conscious about that, I just want to show you uh, another, yeah, those two, uh, at the left side you can see the Nicobar and the Andaman Islands, you know, and this other is Myanmar and uh, the coast of Thailand, and at the right map you can see this uh, island in the corner, in the corner at the left side, uh, almost at the top, this is only this 100 miles away from Indonesia. And of course, also at the entrance of the Strait of Malacca and insofar an extremely important strategic position because you can dominate it. So far, if you 
are thinking and talking about India, also you have uh, to reflect that India, of course, uh, is not only a continental state, but has uh, quite uh, some importance. Yeah, and of course, this central position also shows that there are many uh, Indians also in other countries. This is only uh, the population in African countries where Indian people do have uh, quite an influence, especially in economy. On the whole, there are more than 30 million Indians living overseas. This is less than Chinese. Overseas Chinese people are around about 45 to 50 million, but it will only be a question of a few decades and there will be more Indians abroad than Chinese people due to this uh, population increase. Uh, if, you, if we go further on, uh, this is the democ democracy index where you can see the green countries are the more or less democratic countries. And so far you can see also from the system, uh, okay, uh, this certainly will be an advantage of being open for quite some uh, developments. If we now uh, are looking to the challenges, uh, you have to say, and uh, Hans Niesel also pointed it out, you know, of course, if you compare India with China, the rate of uh, urbanization is by far lower at the moment. This will be the development of the coming years. You see, in 1990, this was around about the same mm. thing, urbanization only 25%. Now, in China, it's already uh, more than half, and the tendency goes already to two-thirds, uh, and uh, India still is behind. This will come. Insofar, of course, the development of the cities uh, will be quite interesting. The same employment sector, you can see in uh, Agriculture, still around about 40% of the Indian population are working for agriculture. Uh, and uh, in China, it's only 17%, much less. Highly interesting, you know, that uh, India has reached already in more or less one sector, a globally dominant position. This is, uh, uh, if you compare it with China, China has become the so-called working bench, the global working bench, yeah? And India has become the global office due uh, to its stronghold in services and especially also the development of software uh, and IT uh, uh, competence. Insofar, uh, this is different, but of course, the industrial factor is still lagging behind it. Insofar, this will be quite important. Uh, GDP comparison, you can see at the moment, you know, in 2015, it was almost five times higher uh, in China than in India. Mm -hmm. The forecast for 2050 is, of course, that it will be much, much closer already from the percentage, you know, uh, due to the development that is expected uh, by experts. Yeah, nuclear powers, uh, India is one of them, but not the biggest one. I do not, uh, I do not uh, make any more uh, comments. One of the big challenges, certainly, is this uh, highly structured country. 28 states and plus eight union territories. You can imagine, if you just look to Austria with nine Bundeslanders, how difficult it is to make <laughs> anything in politics. Just think, you know, when you have even uh, states with 100 million, 250 million inhabitants, how difficult it must be in India to get a political decision at the national uh, level. And therefore, you know, you always have to think what can be done in order uh, to overcome the structural uh, deficit just by uh, the political structure of the country. And in addition of that, you also have your ethnicities and languages. I do not go into details, but this doesn't make it easier. Okay. The next point that I said was, of course, you know, is the strong rival in the neighborhood. 
and a strong neighbor that has developed uh, already quite a bit, and that managed also more or less, you know, to get influence in almost all the neighbor states uh, of India. Yeah, and this even brought a strategic situation, you know, that on the one hand with the uh, with the, the, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, of course, China became a factor in the whole Indian Ocean, and with the two corridors through Pakistan and Myanmar, of course, it's also uh, a strategic uh, squeezing, more or less, uh, of India and insofar this relationship. On the one hand, it's very complicated, and as uh, the ambassador said, very important to keep it out of dispute, uh, to keep it in a way, you know, that uh, the two sides can live together. Yeah, China's global strategy also shows clearly, you know, not only Southeast Asia, uh, Western Asia, Africa, uh, Latin America, you can see, well, this means uh, somehow, I would not say isolated, but special, specific situation uh, for India. And it also shows very clear the map, if you look uh, at the colors, you know, that probably Russia always will be a partner for, uh, for India due to uh, possible, possible uh, positions versus, uh, versus China. This is very natural. And insofar, Europe never, or the Americans never can expect that India will follow uh, American or European politics just if they want it. Yeah, military strengths, I do not go. Just one thing. Uh, if you compare India with China, around about three times, three and a half or four times uh, as much of expenses and also of capabilities, military expenditure. Uh, one thing that is very important, you know, you can see already here that the green uh, lines, uh, this is India and red is China, that arms imports are pretty high from, uh, or are pretty high from the Indian side, also in the development. In Russia, this has, uh, in China, this has changed quite a bit because they have managed to establish their industry of themselves. This situation means that India, of course, is more or less obliged to uh, look for a way of cooperation and this is going on in the so-called quadrilateral security dialogue, the Quad, uh, with uh, Japan, with America, and, uh, and Australia, because there are similar interests, and this certainly is already an increasing relationship. If anything is thinking that he can play the Indian card, he will be wrong. Nobody will be able to play the Indian card except the Indians themselves. Uh, yeah, and this is the last uh, picture I want to show. This is the religions, because I said uh, to keep this balance between Hindu nationalism and Muslim minority certainly will be one of the most delicate, one of the most uh, difficult uh, balancing uh, situations in politics and insofar uh, this certainly is very, very important. If you have 200 million people uh, aside so, uh, as a mi minority uh, religion, of course, this is of quite some importance. Yeah, in order to sum it up, if you take the strategic triangle, space, power and time, you can say, in the space dimension, India has a very, very central position probably a better geostrategic situation than any other uh, great power, maybe except the Americans between uh, the Atlantic and the Pacific, but certainly as all the others. The power certainly is rising and will be rising, probably very fast uh, in the coming decades. The big question mark you have to uh, put on the time factor. 
Uh, it will depend very much on India's reform process, or the successful reform process, in order uh, to keep the country in this uh, power uh, emerging uh, way that it has uh, taken in the last in the last years. Yeah, and insofar you can say, India certainly has become a rising power, a rising power in the long run with extremely uh, positive perspectives. Whether this can be reached, we cannot tell yet. It is too early. Uh, the way is open, and it will depend very much on the Indians themselves. And with this, I want to thank you for your attention. And at the same time, I want to ask you uh, for questions to the ambassador, to Professor Knittel, or also myself. Okay. Who is the first? <laughs> Who wants to ask a question? Or uh, uh, I see already hand. Or also, give a, please be so nice. Just tell us your name mm -hmm. uh, and very short questions. No, uh, no additional speeches, please. Okay. okay. <laughs> and organization. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Omar Yunus. I'm. Uh, I'm a doctoral student with the University of Vienna. Uh, my question is directed to the ambassador. Um, if I recall correctly, uh, India uh, is aware of the problems concerning the 5G, uh, uh, Chinese 5G. And that's why I think, if I'm not mistaken, even TikTok is banned in India. Uh, but Southeast Asia, which is a geostrategic geo center not far from India, is very welcoming of 5G. How would this dynamic um, influence India's uh, approaching Southeast Asia, especially since Huawei data centers this year alone, uh, if I'm not mistaken, have been built in Indonesia and Singapore, Thailand and Malaysia, for example. Thank you. Okay. Should I reply? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question. Um, in India, we have taken a conscious decision uh, based on national security considerations that we will not go uh, with Chinese companies on 5G. Um, as to Southeast Asia, of course, they take their own decisions as to how uh, they will wish to proceed. Um, um, uh, they have, uh, you know, in fact, even Huawei, for that matter, uh, their biggest overseas uh, product development, software development center is in Bangalore, where they employ 2,000 engineers. Mm? But uh, despite that fact, we have taken a conscious decision not to um, uh, go with them. As far as non-5G is concerned in our telecom networks, we do have a lot of uh, Chinese equipment, whether Huawei or ZTE, but we insist on a very detailed physical and technical inspection of every equipment that comes in. Okay, thank you. Yeah, at the other side, yeah. Thank you. Um, Jan Banerjee, Technical, Technical University of Vienna. Uh, last month, or it was actually this month, the Indian embassy, embassy had invited, had done two events, very interesting events, where they invited um, representatives from the startup scene in India. And there were about 35 of them. And it was uh, very interesting to meet them personally. And India has, it's the third top nation in startups, but to see, because we talked a lot about demography, there is a mind shift with the people in the startup scene. And what I'd like to address is, it's, we have a, we're a small group discussing this now, uh, talking about power. There's military power, political power, cultural power, uh, uh, economic power, but there's a new power that's growing in India. And this is connected to demography and connected to the shift of mindsets. What is remarkable is that these young people that are doing these startups are not primarily interested in making money, but they are interested in solving the problems of the country. Now, we were discussing this. If we have brains, 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 as Professor Nissel had said, we have this huge number of brains, and we have lots and lots of problems in India. If these brains can solve the problems of India, they can solve the problems of the world. We have the problems of the world literally concentrated in one country. So do you think that this could be a discussion which uh, India could put forward uh, 
projection of power, but not in terms of economy or politics, but we really have to solve our problems. And can India become the powerhouse of solving global problems? Yes, um, thank you for that question. And, uh, you know, um, as uh, my uh, co-presenters uh, uh, alluded to, India is a country of such di diversity and uh, also problems in uh, uh, under development in so many different parts of India and such a variety of issues and problems that I look at India really as uh, the laboratory of the world, you know. Uh, not only because we have the manpower to man those laboratories, but also because we have the issues that confront us, whether it be in sustainable living, environment-friendly te uh, technologies and uh, uh, energy sources, or simply just um, uh, how to uh, solve everyday problems. So uh, even in my interactions with, say, for example, international organizations like UNIDO, I tell them that <coughs> you know you need to partner with us we have an ecosystem which is very friendly for experimentation. You develop solutions in India and they will be replicable all over the world in the developing world. You know, you just do, you have to shut your eyes and be able to replicate it. Because we have that diversity, uh, which is uh, very rare in, uh, you know, uh, countries of the world. I don't, um, uh, uh, I don't want to claim that we can solve all the problems of the world, but uh, certainly a large number of issues that confront developing countries, I think you're absolutely right, um, like for countries that are uh, moving up uh, the value chain and uh, you know, want to get their population up by the bootstraps, you know, uh, they will find a lot of resonance in what is happening in India today and be able to replicate that. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I have two hands over there. My question is to the ambassador. Uh, Shubha Bijoya, by the way. Uh, I'm an thank Anubhav, you. a student studying at the Diplomatic Academy. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, as a person who is probably entering the international uh, organizational market soon, it is very often that I have had to repeat many of the things I've heard today by both yourself and by the professor. And just to keep it short, what I wanted to ask is about what do you think that particular statement of yours about increasing in multilateral trust, what the government of India is particularly doing in terms of increasing its representation abroad, because I often find myself outnumbered by students from con other countries in forums and discussions about international affairs more than I see many Indians. Okay, maybe we take a second, uh -huh. the second question at the same time and you can answer mm -hmm. sure. uh, together. My name is Nate Puccini, I'm a graduate student at the University of Vienna. Um, for decades, Russia has been uh, one of India's closest strategic partners, if not India's closest strategic partners. I believe it's the source of the vast majority of India's uh, defense imports and uh, other important defense and economic cooperation. Um, given that recent events uh, will probably lead to a long-term uh, decline in Russian power and a much closer uh, alignment between Russia and China, um, how much of a strategic realignment is this causing in India, and um, to what degree will India have to rethink its uh, alliances and priorities, and how will that be um, done without becoming uh, too reliant on other powers? Okay. Okay. Um, Complicated. You know... Uh, in terms of trust, well, trust is of uh, many dimensions, I suppose. Um, and um, it could be business trust, for example, uh, what makes foreign investment come into a country. Um, in the last five years, India's position in terms of business-friendly uh, environment has gone up by 30 places you know, in the world in the last five years. This is really remarkable. It has never happened to, to any country in such a short period of time. So the, uh, the uh, ease of business uh, index has gone up uh, exponentially in the last five years. Um, we have been extremely welcoming of foreign investment. You have seen Prime Minister Modi himself. He um, always makes it a point whenever he goes abroad to meet the business community, um, the uh, social, he has a lot of social interaction, he has big public events where he meets people. So this is all to present, you know, that India is, well, open, 
as an open country and also open for business. Um, in terms of uh, how we present ourselves, I think there's very little that the government can do uh, by itself in presenting uh, the country. You can put your best face forward and uh, you know make the right noises, and that's what the, a th thousand diplomats are there for, which are really thinly spread all over the world. But really, it is the country that has to speak for itself, and I think India speaks for herself. Second question. Um, you're absolutely right. In Russia has been a close strategic partner for India for a very long time. And uh, I mean, I can share this with you, but in all our interactions with uh, the Western world, um, we have in the last 20, I remember when I, when, I, when I was in the prime minister's office, our refrain would, have, would be that don't push Russia away. Don't push Russia away. Embrace, bring it in. Um, so we are, of course, dismayed uh, by the turn of uh, events that have happened. And um, we will have to deal with the consequences of that. Um, but as I said earlier in my um, statement, that uh, we believe in strategic autonomy. Mm -hmm. We believe that we need to be, to, uh, be strong and self-reliant. And that is why our, whether it be in the area of defense or atomic energy or space, we have attempted to do that. Although we depend a lot today on the Russian uh, nuclear power plants, but we have now launched our own 700 megawatt nuclear power plants. And in the next 10 years, we'll be rolling out 10 of them to uh, generate 7,000 uh, megawatts of electricity by 2030. In space itself, also, we have uh, attained a great deal of uh, self-sufficiency. In defense, we are diversifying our portfolio uh, and also developing our indigenization. So yes, I think um, strategic autonomy is where we uh, ha aim to go in the long run. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Yeah, yes, please, uh, Professor. Uh, my name is Matthew uh, Just maybe the micro yeah. in order to... Uh, my name is Merck Johannes. I teach at this uh, diplomatic academy, Latin America. <laughs> and I was wondering what happened with this initiative you had uh, actually when uh, Lula was in power and uh, the president before uh, Modi was in power. Uh, you had a very interesting alliance, uh, actually, India, Brazil, and South Africa versus BRICS arguing that these three countries, democratic countries, versus the two autocratic or not so democratic country, Russia and uh, China. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there are initiatives from your side to reactivate that alliance, because you have talked today about other alliances, mm -hmm. and I was wondering what is going on there. Thank you. Yes, thank you for reminding me. Actually, there are a number of other alliances that I did not mention. I didn't mention BRICS, for example. I didn't mention IPSA uh, and a few others. But um, India, Brazil, South Africa, yes, it is alive and kicking, I assure you. And even recently, we had a, a ministerial level meeting on it. Uh, as you know, it is uh, more of an economic uh, uh, forum where we exchange notes on what to do, joint projects, people-to-people -people connections, uh, how we can cooperate in industry, in agriculture. Uh, so that is going on. Um, um, you know, um, as you know, uh, Brazil and South Africa both have had issues uh, of their own in the last few years. Uh, their growth rates have uh, kind of not uh, taken off as promised. I mean, we all had very high expectations of their growth. Um, and that has also impacted on BRICS, you know, in terms of uh, what uh, Goldman Sachs thought uh, the BRICS countries would be. Um, so, although at a lower level, but uh, it's still uh, something that we value, um, the, our association with the democracies of the developing world, the very large, uh, important countries for us. At, a, uh, at, a, at that level, in fact, even recently, the um, uh, minister from uh, Brazil was in India uh, for 
replicating their um, you know ethanol production you know the uh, the technologies and uh, developing alternative fuels from uh, carbon uh, fuels so uh, at that level that cooperation is definitely going on still and we will probably have the summit uh, of the ipsa as well next year <coughs> yes yeah. please uh, i have uh, one question uh, over here and then then the ambassador of sudan wants to have uh, my name is Harvey Zoden. Um, I'm a commentator in Chinese media, English language media. And uh, so I have a question for both speakers, actually. And that has to do with the uh, frenemy relationship between China and India. And so I'm, I'm wondering about the soft power aspect of the relationship between the two countries. We know about the military problems on the border. But um, what can India do, especially to help build cultural or soft power bridges to a country like China, given that it's a, a different uh, governmental model? Yes, that's a good and challenging question. <laughs> um, it would be so much easier between democracies, as you rightly identified. Um, so many decisions uh, regarding what China wants to do with its neighbors is determined uh, not really uh, by the public, by the population. Um, uh, so much of it is uh, uh, geostrategic um, and uh, geo-ambition uh, oriented. So it is very hard for me to tell you what it would take for India to engage the population of China to be able to influence the Politburo, to be able to influence the PLA into doing something different from what they are doing. So that is my short answer. Yeah. May I add, the, the, the border problem is not solved since the Second World War. That's one of the main items, main problems between India and China. The McMahon line uh, was introduced by the British, but never accepted by the Chinese. So now we have territories claimed by both sides, and this is one of the main problems. Uh, of course, in, in Eros' time, it was said, uh, Chinese and Indians are brothers. Uh, these times are gone, now they are competitors, I would say. And India always feels itself enclosed between China and Pakistan. They always think of a two-front war when it comes to such a uh, war level. Yeah? So it's, it's a very difficult position for India. Uh, but in the long run, uh, I would sum up, uh, China has already its peak in, in many fields, economically, demogra uh, uh, in, uh, dem demographically, and, and so on. And, and India is really starting now. So that's, that's the difference. Uh, in, in world politics, we may say uh, American policy is at the peak now, but slowly coming down. China is coming up, maybe India is following after in 10, 20 years. So this, uh, it's a very, very complicated story. <laughs> uh, I must clarify, though, that uh, we, in, in, I'm sorry if I'm. No, 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 no. That uh, we really don't look at ourselves as competing with China. You know, China is a far bigger economy. Uh, and uh, it has far bigger resources. So if China looks at India as a competitor, I think it does so only in the area of ideas and uh, democracy and what impact that might have. Uh, so we ourselves don't look at ourselves as competitors to China in any way. Yeah, maybe from my side, I have to say, you know, uh, it was quite interesting for me at... Uh, yeah, not so long ago, it was the four most populated nations that tried to be the leaders of the world. It was the first world, uh, as it was called, was America, the biggest uh, Western nation. The second world, the communist world, was Russia, biggest nation, even bigger than, than uh, America. And then we had China and India leading the third and the fourth world. Both uh, more or less had the ambition to be the unofficial leader uh, of the group of other states that were not integrated. And we still have a little bit this situation, you know, that everything that uh, does not belong to the first world, uh, more or less, is uh, a question of 
uh, competition between China uh, and India. Of course, uh, due to the fact that uh, China was the first one who had really this enormous economic uh, rise, you know, uh, China has won quite an advantage, but uh, you could expect that in the coming decades uh, this will change due uh, to the situation. And uh, maybe, of course, you cannot compare also the cultural effect, you know, uh, chopstick uh, uh, cultures are different to Indian cultures and so on. Uh, but what you can, uh, if you take the Chinese example, you know, at the beginning of the 90s, China had only the double GDP of Austria, of Austria, if you just compare it. I mean, there was such a big difference you could not imagine, you know, uh, to America or whatever. And now India is in a similar position of uh, gaining and maybe uh, winning very fast uh, terrain upwards, you know. Of course, this will be different to the Chinese situation. But what both countries had from the beginning uh, not only as leaders of the third and fourth world, they tried to live up to this ambition of being independent. China wants to be independent of anybody. They never wanted to be dependent on America or Europe or Russia or whoever. And a very similar effect I can see with India. This is also the reason why, why I said in former times, one said nobody can play the Chinese card except the Chinese. Now, this is the, or will be the matter with India. Nobody will be able to play the Indian uh, card except India itself. Uh, which means, you know, India will look at its own interest, will look not to get too dependent on any other nation and try to follow this way. This is out of this, uh, let me say, uh, self-understanding of being a global factor through thousands of years, whether this is China or India, and this will keep on as far as I see it. So, uh, yes, please, Christine Mutonen. I think the ambassador of Sudan also wanted to uh -huh. ask a question. Uh, Christine Mutonen, uh, just a, a short question following what was said before. Um, the Indian card, could the Indian card be um, a solution to the, the difficult situation we are facing now in the big Europe, functioning as a kind of mediator, maybe? Um. To an extent, yes. Um, let me tell you that although, I mean, I have talked about our strategic relationship with Russia and uh, our very long friendship and uh, uh, there's Russia's support for us in difficult times, but that hasn't stopped us from speaking plainly. We may not shout from the rooftops, but uh, in, in, in private we convey what our views are. and. Uh, even in uh, in Samarkand, you saw that Prime Minister Modi quite publicly expressed uh, what our displeasure with uh, the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, therefore, I think there is an element of trust. Um, even in the case of Ukraine, uh, I think for uh, the next day after the annexation of the uh, four areas um, in Ukraine, Prime Minister called up President Zelensky and uh, conveyed to him uh, our views. So we have we have been communicating on both sides. Uh, we have um, sent uh, tons and tons of humanitarian relief uh, to Ukraine. We have made it clear that we um, uh, believe that the UN Charter should be respected, sovereignty and territorial integrity of countries is sacrosanct. So, um, so uh, therefore, um, you know, you know, we have even when the Zaporizhia nuclear power plant, the issue of the protection zone, etc., um, was being discussed in New York when um, uh, Mr. Grossi was there uh, from the IAEA. We were we were supportive of the concept, and uh, we did uh, speak to 
parties involved uh, on that subject. Yes, to answer your question to a degree, yes. Yeah. Is there any other question? Yeah, there is a hand. And okay, thank you very much. Uh, my question is related to the success of India in uh, uh, managing uh, democracy uh, and also at the same time managing uh, diversity. While we in Africa have very big challenges in these two very interrelated aspects. So what do you think are the uh, factors behind the success of India in having a successful and stable democracy in one hand and also in managing diversity, success in managing diversity, and what are the lessons that we in Africa can benefit or can share from the uh, vast experience of India in this respect? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's quite a profound question. Um, so I don't know uh, to what extent I can give you a very comprehensive answer, but I will just talk about the Indian perspective. Um, you know, for us, um, democracy and people's participation are not uh, new or Western concepts. They are not planted because of, uh, it came from the West. Uh, it grew from the soil of India. You know, you had uh, in ancient times, you had from the ancient times downwards, you had, uh, you know, at the, the village level, you had panchayats. We were representatives of the people who would sit together and discuss the issues of the, of the village and come up with solutions. And uh, the uh, head of the panchayat would usually be somebody who is acceptable to all the people. So this was, in a way, a representative democracy. Um, that is one. Secondly, um, the f framers of the Indian constitution had the great faith belief in democracy and that democracy was the only way that could keep India together. Uh, because because India is so diverse and because we are we have so many religions, so many um, languages, so many cultures, democracy was the only thing where anybody could everybody could express their views uh, to exercise their political rights, their social and economic and cultural rights. That was the only environment in which they could do that. So the Indian Constitution, I think, had a big role to play in reinforcing uh, that that view, uh, that uh, uh, that sentiment of democracy. And uh, I think, fortunately, uh, this has um, the people of India have spoken time and time again. You know, governments have come and gone, uh, so it is now very deeply embedded in our. Some people say we have too much democracy. You know. Uh, probably you can never have too much, but uh, uh, they do say that, you know, uh, it's very difficult to take a decision. There are so many different actors. But in the long run, I think that creates stability and the way forward rather than, uh, you know, having decisions which are uh, uh, not consultative. or uh, It's very difficult, I agree, to take decisions in India. There are so many laws which the government has passed which had to be rolled back because there were protests. But... If you try to enforce those laws uh, by force, you would definitely have a reaction which would not be a good thing in the long run. So I think from all these reasons, I think we have been able to be a stable uh, country so far. As I said, it's quite incredible when you look at countries in Europe, um, small countries are unable to form coalition governments for months at a time. It's very difficult to have a government that's stable, but in India, for the last 25 years, we have had governments which have uh, completed five-year terms. You know, we have had five governments which have completed five-year terms. And um, we have had the uh, same uh, party uh, government in the last eight years. And then before that, we had uh, another coalition which was in power for 10 years. So it uh, seems to have worked. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if there is not any hand anymore, I would like to come to an end uh, before I, I close it. I want to say a few words maybe also to the situation, the way I see it, you know, from a European side. It's more than 500 years ago that the Europeans tried to reach India and found America. They did not <laughs> reach India from uh, by the Atlantic way, at least, you know. And a little bit this has happened 
almost up uh, to a period not very long ago. Because even in European Union, India was more or less a subject that was treated by the British because there were so many uh, links and connections and so on. But if you went to Paris or to Berlin or to Vienna or Prague or whatever, there was not extremely high intensity of relationship. With uh, the Brexit, the situation has changed. The British cannot bring uh, India anymore into EU. And insofar, this has become a common task for all the European member states. And they are developing it. That's what I see. And this certainly will bring many more uh, connections in the future. Yeah, uh, this from my European perspective. Before uh, I want to thank you, I also want to announce our next uh, conference. Already next week and next Tuesday, uh, we will talk about Europe's security, new perspectives, uh, together with the ambassadors of Finland and Sweden, because they uh, are going a different way, and uh, also together with an Austrian former Ambassador Zede and also moderated by Ambassador Martin Seidig. Uh, so far, an interesting discussion. Uh, are there consequences also for Austria if you are interested? Next Tuesday, the 18th of October at 7 p.m. here. And now I really want to thank uh, you, Hans. Thank and, you, Anna. Uh, yeah, yeah. Especially you, thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for your presentations. It really was a pleasure to have you here uh, to listen to your presentation uh, and also to follow the discussion. I think the both of them earn a big, a very big hand. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and as promised, of course, we would like to invite you to have a glass of wine and maybe to ask the one or the other questions you could not uh, ask up to now and to talk about how fast will the developing be of this rising power, India. I wish you a very nice evening and thank you very much for your attendance.